welcome to On Geopolitics, a new series of podcasts from the Centre for Geopolitics in which we discuss geopolitical issues in a historical context. My name is Suzanne Rain, and I'm here today with my new partner in crime, Professor Ali Ansari. Hello, and thank you for joining us. One of the events which has dominated this summer was the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Ali and I realised that we both come at this from different areas of expertise. I've been working on Islamist terrorism for a very long time. And I've been working, and my expertise is in Iran, uh, the history of Iran and the Persian world. Of which Afghanistan is a part. Of which Afghanistan is certainly a part. So we thought it would be helpful and hopefully interesting if we brought that knowledge together and explored some of the geographical and mythological history of Afghanistan, the place, and its connectivity with the region. And we're going to start, Ali, by explaining this word Khorasan which you may have heard used, uh, you, the listener, may have heard used particularly recently in the case of Islamic State Khorasan province, which has conducted many serious and and awful terrorist attacks in Afghanistan and appears to now be challenging the Taliban. Khorasan uh, isn't used commonly in Western conversations about Afghanistan, but it's a geographical region which encompasses parts of modern Iran parts of modern Afghanistan, and it also has a mythological Islamic history resonance, which is important to understand. Well, Khorasan is the term used by a number of Islamists, actually, to define an area of the Eastern Islamic world that, in medieval terms, really sort of covered much of what we would now define as northeastern Iran, Afghanistan, parts of Central Asia. It's a rather sort of indeterminate area, but it has sort of a powerful role in in actually the mythology of millenarian movements in the Islamic world. So I think that's why they tend to use it. It's also a rejection in some ways. And, you know, Bin Laden used this in the 1990s. You know, it's, it's his rejection of the term Afghanistan, which they see really as a modern creation. So Afghanistan as a state, as a product, as they see it, of, you know, Western imperialism. And, you know, in some ways it is, but in actual fact, uh, you know, Afghanistan is the product of, in many ways, you know, three imperial rivalries, not just the British and the Russian, but also the Persians in the middle and how they sort of competed for influence in this sort of mountainous region. So, you know, Afghanistan itself as a sort of recognisable, territorially delimited country is really a product of the 19th century. Can you take us right back to the history? Because was Khorasan greater Khorasan? Because sure. I, I know that there That's is... That's the term they use, of course. Yeah, yeah I know there's, there's a province in current modern-day Iran That's which right. is called Khorasan, but the greater Khorasan, was it ever a sort of a place in its own right? Does it? Well, it was. I mean, I, I suppose it, it was a territory, um, but again, you know, when we're talking about the pre-modern era, it's pretty loosely defined. I mean, we don't have sort of clearly defined borders. You know, you could almost consider it as borderlands, the marcher area, where, you know, the fringes of the Islamic world. And of course, it comes to prominence in Islamic history because that is where the Abbasid revolution and the 8th century sort of emerges and this notion of the black flags and a number of the hadiths that are still recited today, these traditions of the the prophet uh, that are used in, you know, they're meant to be sort of prophetic in some ways. I mean, a number of these had supposedly predicted the rise of the Abbasids, which was this medieval revolution that overthrew the first dynasty in Islam, the Umayyads, and put in the Abbasids that were from the family of the Prophet. The Abbasids, in that sense, the Abbasid revolution was meant to be, in effect, the restoration of the dynastic Muslim rule. So you had this sort of narrative of the place in the east. Because what does the name... Well, Khorasan just simply means, actually, in Persian, just means the land where the sun rises, effectively. So you could say the land of the rising sun. But it's simply, really, um, a descriptor of the east, effectively, Mm. you know, where the sun Mm. rises. So there's nothing actually that mysterious about it. Although these days, because of all the sort of the mythologies and the apocalyptic myths and other things that are associated with it it's given this sort of rather sort of mysterious layer and of course as we'll discuss i think a, a little bit later there are some intriguing if perhaps slightly worrying uh, you know uh, coincidences between both the shia and the sunni mythologies that are developing as you've looked at with sunni groups and i've looked at with with obviously what's going on in iran so ali i know you and i differ on the extent to which we should mythologize the Khorasan. And my real question is, it wasn't ever a proper state. It is now a province in modern day 
Iran. Mm. But obviously it has been part of a much, the sort of Greater Khorasan thing was part of a much broader political entity, wasn't it? You know, I don't think we differ too much in terms of Khorasan as a geographical area exists in the medieval world. I mean, in the medieval world, they refer to, even medieval geographers refer to this sort of Eastern Islamic world as sort of Khorasan or Greater Khorasan. I think the interesting thing is how modern Islamists, in a way, have taken this medieval concept and turned it to good political use. So in one sense, I mean, for me, you know, what I hope listeners will appreciate is that Khorasan is a real place. I mean, it is there. It's it's a territory. So can we talk about what what... What cities? What are the big cities of Khorasan? Well, I mean, these would be anything coming from Mashhad in Iran to, to Herat to, you know, Balkh. You know, I think... Um, there so, so big, a big part of modern-day Afghanistan. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, and also and further afield. So yeah. is, it would Bukhara count? Or? I think, I mean, I, you know, again, these things are sort of quite fluid. But yes, I think Bukhara, Samarkand. I mean, the way they refer to it is basically this vast ge- geographic expanse that is this undefined part of the Eastern Islamic world. Um, and the reason they use it, of course, today is because they're rejecting the notion of these modern states. Yeah. Modern states are, in their view, European constructions, products of the modern world, of which for which, uh, which they don't want to have anything to do with, frankly. So, you know, Bin Laden and the others, and now we have, as you know, you know the ISIS-K or whatever, you know, what they're talking about, really, is they're sort of rejecting this notion that there's any, any such state as Afghanistan. Um, in that sense, the Taliban are quite modern, actually. I mean, it's got, you know, they're, they're yeah. accepting that they're a government of a territory. And to some extent, of course, you know, what they're saying in terms of Afghanistan being a creature, in a sense, of development of the modern world, as many states are, of course, is is not untrue. I mean, you know, the, the, the Afghanistan as a distinct political body is really a product of the 18th and 19th centuries. The breakdown of one of the last great Persian imperiums under a king known as Nader Shah, when he died in the mid 18th century, his one of his Afghan generals basically split off the territory that we now know as Afghanistan and set himself up, Ahmad Durrani. And then subsequently in the 19th century, despite Iranian attempts to basically seize back the province of Herat and the city of Herat, which they always considered, by the way, to be part of Iran. I mean, this is the interesting thing, and it's Persian speaking. And we have to remember, of course, Afghanistan in a cultural sense has less to do with South Asia. And we always talk about Afghanistan in relation to South Asia. But actually, Afghanistan, I think, can be better understood in relation to Iran. And historically, it's very clear. And the Iranians tried, finally, well, several attempts in the early 19th century to reclaim Herat, partly at the encouragement of the Russians, as to be said. The British resisted. I mean, interestingly enough, we talk about the Anglo-Afghan wars and, and all this, but Actually, the British were very keen on protecting the territorial integrity, as they saw it, of this fledgling state, and eventually went to war over it. I mean, they went to war over it with Iran in 1856, defeated the Iranians. And then in 1857, at the Treaty of Paris, you finally get this sort of acceptance by the Iranians that they can't take Herat, that Herat is now part of Afghanistan. You know, I suppose that the, the shape, the territory of Afghanistan, as we understand it today, beca- comes into uh, form in 1857. But of course, for Islamists, as you know, much better than me, uh, you know, this is complete gibberish. I mean, as far as they're concerned, Afghanistan is a completely made up place. Yeah. For them, you know, Afghanistan is the myth. Khorasan is the real place. Whereas for us, we sort of look at it and say, Well, you know, Khorasan is a bit of a sort of a medieval, you know, it's a bit like saying someone talking about Francia or wanting to talk about, you know, Mercia or Wessex. I mean, yes, you know, we can talk about it, but it's slightly lost in the mists of time. For them, it has this political utility because in a single word, what he's saying, he's rejecting the modern world. He's rejecting that sort of European world. And I think as you, you know, we're going to talk Mm. about, um, allows them to talk about all these wonderful prophetic hadiths and other things, which which emanate, as they say, from Khorasan. Which is which is precisely the thing is that it, it's not just a rejection of of modern states, mm. but it has this tremendous emotional pull. But it's an emotional pull based on a belief system in a way. So it's not it's not simply emotion. And that goes back to, to this hadith. That's right, yeah. Uh, so which, it triggers, doesn't it? It triggers in them something, which yeah. is quite interesting. And and, and and the hadith, so it's called the hadith of, of, of Khorasan or the hadith of the black banners. That's right. And and what it says in this, in this hadith uh, is, if you see the black banners coming from Khorasan, join that army, even if you have to crawl over ice, 
no power will be able to stop them and they will finally reach Jerusalem where they will erect their flags. So in, in apocalyptic or prophetic terms, this is a really important hadith for um, particularly the Sunni Islamists, but I think we'll talk a bit more about well, I think, that. Well, I think the interesting thing is is that there's a degree of overlap, which is a bit worrying, isn't it? You know, but... <laughs> well, it's confusing because <laughs> I mean, yeah. clearly this is a hadith that, that applies. I mean, it's, it's very evocative. And what it basically says is the armies with black flags will come from the east and nothing can stop them until they reach Jerusalem. So, so that is the message. And... One of the things that happened, actually, it started, um, the, the sort of modern iteration of this, I think, started with the siege of the Great Mosque in Mecca, where right. Jehaman al Utaybi, oh, who right. was one of the main sort of leaders of that, was really into all the apocalyptic prophecies. And he used the apocalyptic prophecies in the Hadith to, to sort of to stimulate Islamist do you, movement. Do you think that, you know, the business in the Grand Mosque, and I mean, was it in some ways also triggered or catalyzed by the Islamic Revolution in Iran as well? I mean, was there an element of well, that? Well, they definitely all happened at the same time, That's what they, didn't yeah. they? I know they were Because I know the Saudis and, get a bit sensitive about yeah. it, but it was, is there a, I mean, is there an overt connection, do you think, or not? I don't know if there's an overt connection. Gosh, this is off topic slightly, but yeah. the three things happened at the same time. Yeah. The Russians invaded Afghanistan, the siege of the Great Mosque, and oh, this true, yeah, Islamist, yeah. you know, oh, sorry, Islamic revolution in Iran. And that kind of changed the landscape of everything. But for Osama bin Laden, uh, who was very influenced by, by the siege of the Grand Mosque, this thing about, about the fulfillment of the prophecies and the, and the sort of myths around the things that led to the fulfillment of the prophecies was really important. And just for those of our listeners who don't understand the sort of narrative of what happens with the fulfillment of the prophecy, I'm just going to very briefly explain how the apocalypse works. And Go then you it. can see why Khorasan fits into this. We're always very positive in the geopolitical podcast. We like to talk about the apocalypse. The apocalypse, yeah. Ali, yeah. has stages, right. uh, which we're working through right now, I think. Okay. Um, after the prophet, which we've had, Muslims would be ruled by a succession of political regimes, just and unjust, right. culminating in the restoration of the caliphate, which we have now had, sort of, and that's obviously disputed. Yeah. And then the death of the caliph. I mean, you're talking when you talk about the caliphate, you're talking about the Daesh. Yeah. Ah, I so, see. so this is yeah. what I'm. But yeah, interesting. It doesn't necessarily fit. And yeah. This is the whole thing. The death of a caliph. Um, not there is a lot of caliphs, so that's it doesn't right. have to be the death of the, the caliph, yeah. the Cal- Abu Bakr Baghdadi. Death of the caliph, the final caliph, presages the coming of the Mahdi or the Messiah. Ah. And then the prophet Isa, which is Jesus, would appear at the white minaret of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. And his appearance would summon the Antichrist. And there would then be a mighty battle at the gate of Lod, which is somewhere around where Ben Gurion Airport is now. And Jesus would win the, the mighty battle with, with the Antichrist. And thereafter, mankind would live as Muslims in a time of sincerity before the day of resurrection, when all living things would be called before God for the final judgment. So that's the kind of apocalyptic narrative. And there's a series of signs which presage this end of days, Mm. great battle between Prophet Jesus and the Antichrist. And one of those signs is from this hadith that the armies with black flags will come from the land of Khorasan and they won't stop until they get to Jerusalem. So that's something which in sort of Islamist narrative, Osama bin Laden, when he, um, I think particularly when he moved to Afghanistan from the Sudan in 1996, Mm. he gave a number of interviews at that time and he didn't use the word Afghanistan. He used the term Khorasan. Yeah, he always used the term Khorasan. And, and as you remember as well, the, the Al-Qaeda flags are they're the black. black. They're the yeah, black they're flags. Black so flags. it's not an accident. It's it's deliberate. And he said, um, he was interviewed by Time magazine in 1996 when he announced he'd moved to Afghanistan. And he said he'd found a safe base in the high Hindu Kush mountains in Khorasan. And again, he said, so God helped me and we came to the land of Khorasan once again. We're in an invincible land which enjoys security, pride and immunity against the humiliation and subjugation. So so he's setting himself up in this mythical place with the black banners. And that starts, you know, it sets in people's minds. As, as but I've got a question for you. I mean, yeah. Is it a mythical place in his mind? Is oh. it not a real place? Is he not actually fulfilling 
the elements of what he perceives to be the prophecy. I mean, what it's it's yeah. real, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's a, I mean, this is the interesting thing, and I, I mean, what you've said there, which is I have to say, uh, much more detail than I was aware of. Um, you know, in in Iran, interestingly enough, they do have this mythology that only a certain group of the initiated has to be. Because always good, all these good sort of like mythologies, it's the initiated, isn't it? You have to be part of that in a group. Um, and they talk about the Sayyid Khorasani, that there will be this leader that will come out of Khorasan, yeah. the Lord, yeah. Sayyid Khorasani. And this Sayyid Khorasani, with not as much detail, I have to say, as, as you put out, uh, will basically be the sort of the forerunner preamble, if you will, to the return of the Mahdi, the hidden image. Which, so that bit's the same. So that it? bit's the yeah. same in the whole bits with Jesus yeah. and others. Um I have to admit, you know, my own readings of what I think is like, sadly, I'm not part of the initiated, so I don't get to see, I think, some of the detail. But some of the, uh, you know, there are some interesting coincidences of interest. And it does make you think, I suppose, in a way, you know, how Iran's relationship at the moment with, you know, Taliban, Afghanistan mm. is uh, developing. Although here's the interesting thing, of course, is, as we were talking earlier, of course, the Taliban have white flags. Uh, they don't have black flags. Whereas mm. for the Iranians, of course, and the Shias, uh, it is black flags all the way because mm. the Abbasid revolution is the unfurling of the black flag. The Abbasid revolution, in some ways, is meant to be, you know, the indication of the return of the family of the prophet to, mm. to political control. It's obviously not Shia, strictly speaking, but nonetheless, it's it's meant to be more approximating to what Shias might want or believe, and clearly against the the Umayyads in in, in, in Damascus. So the whole iconography of the black flags and the unfurling mm. of the black flags mm. and the sort of um, that's something that's quite prominent in Shia eschatology and belief. And, of course, coming from Khorasan and what Khorasan means, of course, in the Iranian sense, which is quite mm. interesting, is they actually really are talking about the province. So you come from Khorasan. So if you think about it, Ayatollah Khamenei, who's the current supreme leader, is from Khorasan, right? His family are from Khorasan, mm. from Mashhad and these areas. Uh, Ayatollah, current president, uh, Hujat al-Islam Raisi, uh, is from Khorasan. So there's this sort of what I call this sort of mash mafia, actually, mm. sort of, who are the, the, this sort of group of people who are all emanating from Khorasan. And I think play on this fact mm. that you've got this hadith that says that some sort mm. of great sort of um, uh, developments of that mm. shattering development come from it. And I think one of the fascinating things for us, uh, if slightly worrying, <laughs> is this sort of like the synergies that you might find between mm. Sunni Islamists mm. uh, like bin Laden mm. and his ilk, which the Iranians actually don't really get on with. I mean, they find a lot of things to sort of, um, at least publicly, mm. you know, uh, disavow of Daesh and mm. ISIS and all this sort of thing. And yet, as you're saying, they sort of share, a, I don't know, a sort of an understanding of the way in which Islamic history will, mm. Islamic history will unfold. Um, so there's a question, Ali, about, um, obviously Iran is one of Afghanistan's neighbours, and as you mentioned, there are cultural and historical links, mm. particularly from parts of Afghanistan and to parts of Iran. And Iran has a destiny which they see as inimical to, to Western destiny in in well, at least in the, the, way, the, re the yeah, revolution. The revolution. Yeah. Um, so there's a proper question, really, about how these dynamics play out on modern day Afghanistan. Do you think there are people in Iran who still see Herat as under their field of influence, you know, will they seek to... I mean, not, not just Herat. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> well, the whole... I mean, how far would you go with that? Well, I mean, it's interesting. And it's, so what, what are the, what's the Iranian sort of attitude to the Afghans? Well, they're basically a bit sort of more, more rustic and rather sort of vulgar Iranian. I mean, it, the, the relationship is a close historical and cultural one. Uh, basically, if you look at the Afghan ethnic makeup and see them, the Hazaras, Tajiks, Pashtuns, so the Tajiks and Hazaras are really sort of the pro, the persifier, if I can put it that way. The Pashtuns are seen as slightly sort of like uh, beyond the pale. The, the the more fractious relationship historically between Iran and you know tribes that come out of Afghanistan are with the Pashtuns. I mean, those are so in collective his, Iranian historical memory, there is this view of the Afghans, and the Afghan is really the term they use for the Pashtuns, by the way, that mm. it was the sort of the, the Afghans who overthrew the Safavids in the early 18th century in a very, very bloody campaign and, you know, basically destroyed Isfahan and, and made a complete mess of it. And there's sort of in the popular perception, you know, these are the barbarians at the gates. I mean, that's basically the way they look at it, even though they really are barbarians, if I can put it that way. I mean, because, um, you know, the official language in, in Afghanistan and stuff is Dari, which is essentially a dialect of 
it's a sort of a Persian, you know, we can, you know, it's understandable. So the Iranians feel that essentially, you know, Afghanistan is, is, is in a sense a sister, a sister state. But they certainly believe, I mean, to be more specific in a sense, that those Western provinces of Afghanistan, Herat in particular, Farah province, Nimruz, these are, these are the areas that are really part of an, an older Persian patrimony. Yeah. Um, there are other places, of course, I mean, Mesopotamia and the Caucasus and stuff are, are areas where the Iranians see these as they're near abroad. But it's very striking that the, you know, the, and there's lots of Afghan refugees in Iran and there's lots of sort of like... Uh, um, Connection it was very striking. Ismail Khan, you know, the warlord, the lion of Herat, uh, when he fled recently into Iran and came to Mashhad, he actually said as he arrived that it's good to be back in the mother country. And he was very explicit about it. Now, of course, it's good diplomacy. He's come in as effectively a refugee and the mm. Iranians will love it. Mm. But the fact is, you know, there's a huge, huge connection between the two countries. And, you know, Ahmad Massoud, Ahmad Shah Massoud's mm. son, who's busy mm. fighting or you know holding his own in Panjshir. I mean basically he grew up in Mashhad, you know, after his father's assassination after War 9 11. You know, he grew up. So again, those cultural links are extremely tight. And I think one of the things we have to be aware of, I suppose, is that the relationship is not just a sectarian, if I can put it that way. It's not just about these sort of religious beliefs and myths. There's a strong sort of ethnic and historical and, you know, what we might call a sort of secular mythology that goes on about, about between Iran and Afghanistan. Many of the sort of the, the great heroes in Iranian mythology, if you look at them, are from Afghanistan, in modern Afghanistan. Have you got some examples of those? God, I couldn't think of the top of my head, but I, maybe we can go back and have a look. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're from places like Balkh and, you know, and Herat. And, you know, there are, you know, these are mythological heroes that emerge from, basically, if you look at it, and this is quite... I suppose, interesting as well, is that the Iranian national, and I use that term with some qualification, of course, uh, mythology in the Book of Kings, which is this sort of great narration of Iranian sort of ascent from the dawn of time, is a product of Khorasan, actually. It's a product of the Eastern Iranian world. Yeah. And these narratives come from there. Nothing to do with Islam at all, by the way. I mean, I just emphasise that. It's all to do with this foundation myth, creation myth, whatever you want. And a lot of these figures populate cities that range from you know obviously Iran today as we have it all through to Afghanistan to Turkmenistan yeah. and up. so the, the the interesting thing I suppose for us when we're looking at this is it's very multi-layered you know these Islamist myths are but one yeah if you know as you're outlining there because of things that are going on uh, some of the more uh, important and misunderstood I'm going to flip right back into the sure. harsh reality of the present good, day, good. which which mirrors, I think, your what you were talking about then, and talk about Daesh Khorasan right. province. Okay. Um, because it's more interesting that there, there are more curious parallels than you'd think in, in sort of geographical terms, I think. So obviously Daesh, the Islamic State Caliphate, was announced uh, in June 2014, it's Khorasan province. It, had, it was organised by a number of provinces, oh, of right. which one is the oh, Khorasan okay. province. Okay. That was formally established in January 2015. And it's been much more resilient than people would have thought. It's been Everyone, around for a while. It's been it? around for a while. And people <laughs> thought, oh, no, you know, the Taliban will totally yeah, yeah. take control over yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. We'll just ignore this. But yeah. in fact, what it is, is sort of fresher, younger, angrier than yeah, than yeah. the Taliban. And and it obviously had that huge energy, which came from the establishment of Caliphate, the narrative of the fulfillment of the prophecies, which drew everybody into this sort of collective endeavour. And being the Khorasan province, it, you know, has a role in that. And one of the things I think that people didn't realise was how, although it was located primarily in a sort of southeast of Afghanistan, it also had presence near Balkh, near mazar e sharif oh, that's interesting. And in fact, we don't really know quite a lot of this in any detail, but basically um, it pulled down jihadist people from Central Asia and became a magnet for, for foreign fighters from mountainous republics in, in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, mm. for example, and, and basically, as the jihadists have come under increased pressure in Syria, they've had to have somewhere else to go. And so you have this kind of sense of Afghanistan, again, being a place, being Khorasan, where those networks from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, um, who already have these links into Daesh Khorasan province, have somewhere to go. So I think there's 
there's something interesting which we don't properly understand again happening with the resonance of Khorasan mm. to a completely different group of people with a completely different set of beliefs, Ali. And this is where I think we come back to, although at the heart of this, they share an understanding of, of this sort of idea of Khorasan, their idea of what you do with the idea of Khorasan is, yeah, very, I'm different. Sure. It is very different. Um, so, yeah, so, so the Iranians, they're, they're Shia, they have um, ethnic links to, to one sort of set of people in Afghanistan. Absolutely. The Islamist extremists, um, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, which are sort of not quite exactly on the same lines, but but not too dissimilar. And then Daesh, you know, ethnically might be different again. Um, certainly the, the Taliban tend to be a majority Pashtun, not entirely, but majority. So so the question is how how all of this might resolve itself. And that's obviously a huge question that we can't answer but are they going to come to blows i mean clearly the taliban and daesh khorasan province are already at, at loggerheads mm. and and will continue to be i don't think they can coexist easily because they both claim the sort of inheritance in yeah. a way but interestingly as you were saying you know the taliban in a sense are claiming the modern inheritance yeah, yeah but, but, government but, of but, Afghanistan. but the daesh khorasan province claims yeah, the caliphate. The same, yeah, the, the slightly larger. Yeah, yes, yeah, so, <laughs> the same place. Well, while, while Iran is, you know, what are they claiming in the modern world? Well, they're claiming leadership of the Muslim world. Yeah, I mean that's what they're claiming, and they're claiming that you know the Islamic Revolution is this sort of like uh, great, almost revelation in Islamic history. Um, you know, their problem is that they're Shia, and of course the majority of the Muslim world are Sunni, so they're not going to really uh, see eye to eye. But I think what you're saying is that there are, you know, the mythology is proving that sort of it, it's it's squaring the circle, isn't it? I mean, it's if you share that same understanding of the sort of unfolding uh, of Islamic history in that sense, it, despite the fact that there obviously be disagreements on particularities, but your broad vision in a sense might be similar. Then there's there's perhaps a little bit more coincidence of interests and a little bit more where they can work in. I mean, to be honest, from my perspective, when I mean, looking at Iran, I think it would be a very hard sell. I mean, in Iran for them, because uh, you know, while to be blunt, you know, the regime in Iran has made great play of the fact that it's opposed to Daesh and the others, and it's it's fought against them obviously in Iraq and and and, and, and Syria. And remind me, because I do want to ask you a question about the, the, the Western side of it, because the definitions there are quite interesting, too. But, it, it, you know, this idea that they can suddenly sort of all, I don't know, meld in together. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there are some. I mean, I'm sure there are some Muslim thinkers in the Shia world who do feel that at the end of time or whatever, or when we get to it, they all go back to being one you know, big happy family. And there won't be Shias and Sunnis this year. They'll all be one together. But I, I think. I mean, I have to say, it would be quite a quite a big mm. ask. I don't know how they're going to... Um, it would explain, I suppose, to some extent, geopolitical consider considerations aside, how some people in the Iranian regime did collaborate in some ways with the Taliban and with elements of al-Qaeda in the post-9-11 period. Well, of course... The Much number, to my horror, I have to say. The but, deputy uh, leader of al-Qaeda... Was sitting in Iran. ...has been it? in Iran, yeah. Saif al-Adl, has been in Iran for the in, almost the entire time yeah and he was under osama bin laden he in the 90s he was responsible for maintaining the relationships with with the taliban oh, so right. oh, as far right. as we know he's oh. still in iran okay and the you know it's been presented in different ways at different times so he's under house arrest yeah they uh, sort of present it in iran as if yeah he's under he's he's our guest they yes. say, in inverted commas yes. and we keep an eye on him and of course, the argument that is presented to the wider the Iranian population is this also protects us because it's a way of sort of saying to them, don't, don't attack us. But then, you know, Iran has been, you know, the target of some, you know, ISIS or, or, or Sunni radical attacks, mm -hmm. uh, both in Baluchistan and, of course, in, in, in uh, Khuzestan and those areas. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag, I mean, in, in the sense of what it actually means. How do you think the current Iranian leadership will approach their relationship with the Taliban? Well, at the moment, I mean, what's striking about it is that they, I mean, it's been very interesting, actually. At the moment, they sort of welcome the Taliban victory, uh, much to, I have to say, the um, uh, consternation of much of the Iranian populace who, who actually view the Taliban with 
quite deep horror. I mean, they, they sort of see them. It's not simply going back to the, you know, it's not simply this sort of dislike of uh, religious radicalism. It's also, as I've said, you know, earlier, some of the sort of ethnic condescension that goes on about the Afghans as being somewhat rustic and a bit less, you know, civilised than we are. Um, so I think, you know, the, there's a difficulty there. And uh, what's happened over even the last two, three weeks is that some of the, the varnish, in a sense, is starting to come off because I think the, there's several things here. One is that the regime in Iran realises that cozying up too much to the Taliban doesn't play well with its own constituency. So, you know, there was a moment, you know, for instance, where they actually sent out instructions to the Iranian press that they mustn't use the word savage, you know. and you just <gasps> got, Yeah, you mustn't use the word savage in relation to the Taliban because, of course, what, what the Iranian press were doing is this bad shit on it. You know, it's this savage, you know, Taliban. So they said, you mustn't, you know, you must be a bit more, you know, sympathetic I suppose but actually not all papers have actually adhered to that I mean so one of the centrist papers is actually called them terrorists I mean there's very clearly Taliban terrorists etc um, and used actually the English term for it yeah. so the, there's a degree of friction there I think between you know what the regime in Iran at the moment wants to do and, and, and what I think even some you know in the press and others uh, are willing to do but I think also there's a little bit of wariness about what the Taliban might mean for Iran mm. in the medium to, to longer term. So there's a, de- there's a degree of sort of hedging one's bets, I suppose, in terms of what they might be. I think they share, at least publicly, a very open dislike of, you know, ISIS-K, isis Khorasan. Mm. Uh, but also the Iranians are quite keen to keep their hands in with the warlords. I mean, mainly their influence with the warlords. What's quite striking, I think, is the new head of the Quds Force, Ismail Ghani, uh, made his name really in Afghanistan. That's where he's, his expertise is. What was he doing in Afghanistan? I think he was the chief liaison with uh, a lot of the warlords at the time, along with Soleimani, actually. I mean, Soleimani, when Soleimani was head of the Quds Force, he uh, was also... But Soleimani, of course was always seen as an Arabist. I mean, his, 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 mm. although, I mean, he seemed to be everywhere, obviously, mm. but he, he was seen, his primary uh, skills were really seen as being, you know, fluent in Arabic, dealing with the situation in the West. Ghani, on the other hand, is not an Arabist. I mean, he doesn't speak Arabic. His expertise is in the East. So, you know, who knows? I mean, they, they might sort of re-energize or restart some of these relationships. And of course, they've got these Fatimian brigades, you know, the, yeah. the Afghan Shia that yeah. they packed off to Syria. Yeah. So, so, so these are basically there and, and, and presumably could be, could be sent back in if they wanted to. But I suspect at the moment the Iranians are trying, you know, to watch and see yeah. and monitor it. Um, I, I mean, I think, interestingly, on a broader sense, it would be interesting to see what the relationships with Pakistan will look like, actually, yeah. because they're probably not overly excited by the fact that the Pakistanis seem to be, you know, very supportive yeah. of the Taliban at the moment. Yeah, and of course, Pakistan also has a significant Shia min- minority. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, so what you're getting across this area is these sort of series of mini fault lines between Sunni and Shia, which yeah. which aren't, again, which are not contiguous with geographies necessarily, yeah, absolutely. certainly not in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I suppose, Ali, that's, um, we need to come to the end of our interesting yeah. discussion, but, but I think something interesting has happened with the emergence in Afghanistan of a new Islamic polity. I mean, yeah. it, 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 that's, that's what the Taliban has created. And is in a sense, that's what the Iranian revolution did in Iran. And and the, the difference is one is Shia and one is Sunni. Well, I mean, you're, you're right, because there's some very, there are some very um, unfavourable comparisons being drawn, I have to say, between so commentators on Iranian social media, you know, when the Iranians sort of say, look at this, look at this cabinet that they've set up, you know, all these sort of mullahs and all that. And of course, the Iranian commentators are saying, well, how's that different <laughs> from you know, what the hell we're doing? We just yeah. seem to do it with slightly more poetry or something. I mean, it's, you know, there's some some interesting jibes going on at the moment. I mean, they're saying that it's, uh, you know, what the Taliban are doing is basically what, you well, know, Iran did. has done. I mean, yeah. and, is, and is doing, by the way. I mean, that's no. But as an example, I'm really interested that that Iranian reaction has been competitive and negative yes. in a way, yes. because another way of looking at it is it was concerning when there was one of these states and now there's two. And although they have a different... Oh, what, in terms of ISIS? No, in terms of... Oh, in terms, in, of, in terms yeah. of, um, oh, in terms of Iran and, and now Afghanistan. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, you yeah. essentially have no, um, an avowedly... Islamic government mm. in a way which in most other states there's some kind of mix of modern. I mean the other interesting thing I have to say is it might play well for the regime in Iran in the sense that they have something to compare to which is even worse <laughs> I, I mean do, do you know what I mean, I mean they, they can sort of say well look at this it could get even worse you know look at them 
Um, and of course, the Iranians, you know, horrified by this notion that the Afghan hordes will be coming down as they did in 1722, will, will sort of be saying, oh, my God, you know, better, better the devil, you know, I mean, it, it, this is not. What something. happened in 1722? 1722 is when, when this sort of rebellion in Iran's eastern provinces, i.e. now modern Afghanistan, led in sort of an Afghan rebellion, in inverted commas. Uh, which eventually, after many years of, of failed policy, it has to be said, uh, marched on Isfahan and overthrew the Safavids. So the Safavid dynasty collapsed in 1722 after a very long and brutal siege. And uh, interestingly enough, was uh, uh, the discussion of one of the earliest PhDs in, in the Western Europe on Iran, uh, which uh, actually had this wonderful title on the current revolutions in Persia, which I thought was sort of rather appetite in 1722. Know, might as well start as we mean to go on. So it was... Uh, it was um, um, you know, it was a major shock to the system, to many people, that the Safavid dynasty, this great sort of like uh, Persian empire in a sense at the time, very wealthy, should succumb to this sort of Afghan tribal threat. And uh, uh, the Afghan interregnum, as I, as people call it, didn't last for more than a few years. I mean, there was a sort of, a, as I said, this resurgence against them by um, Persian forces who then incorporated you know, these Afghan territories into a new Persian empire. What I'm trying to say, I suppose, is to sort of say that, you know, there are these historical, ethnic, sectarian, I mean, it's, mm. it's a very mm. multi-layered mm. relationship. We're going to have to stop there, are, are we? we? Well, Sadly, I just we could, think... We could go on and on, but surely listeners will be fed <laughs> up with us now. Maybe we should do so. Yeah, I don't know whether, you know, these millenarian mythologies are all a bit worrying, aren't they? But uh, I think the, the thing, Ali, and you and I were discussing this uh, before we started, is, of course... The alarming thing is that the end, which is to de devoutly to be desired, is, of course, a tremendous battle. Um, yeah, it's a great conflict. Saying. Yeah. It's a, um, but I mean, it's a bit like these sort of Christian millenarians in, yeah. in the West. I mean, they have this sort of final battle. That's, uh, you know, the, the, the worrying thing. I think, you know, for our perspective, I, I know, you know, you and I agree on this. From someone coming from the outside looking at this, all this seems sort of like palpable nonsense, which in many ways, you know, a lot of these conspiracy theories, mythologies, whatever are, I mean, to someone who is not part of the initiated. I think the, the trick is, is really for us to, I suppose, try and convey to listeners and anyone here that mm. very important to try to get inside the mind of these people. And, and how they think mm. about the world around them. And I think that's why these 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 myths, these these ideas are extremely important. Because otherwise, you know, you get a series of people talking about Khorasan as if, you know, I mean they don't just they just don't get it. I mean they don't either they dismiss it, uh, or they, you know, they just don't understand it, or they talk about it in ways that just don't make sense. What you really need to do is, I suppose, in some ways strip away some of the verbiage, but also see as you, you know, outlined it. Depressing detail, I have to say, the hadith and how it sort of how they understand and explain the world around them and how they fit that all. You know, so for them, the defeat of the Soviet Union, the defeat of the United States, these are major events on the They're onward all march towards yeah. the fulfillment yeah. of the prophecy. So, that's right, and that's why it will continue to be even when we've all you know moved on to the next exactly thing and forgotten yeah. about Afghanistan they won't be they won't be because they're living in Khorasan <laughs> exactly and they they know why Khorasan is so important as a step in the journey so that's why we need to continue watching it and I think we may revisit this at some time in the future might we, so? we might well we might well we do okay thank you so much thank you for listening uh, tune in next time 